you will find it worth fighting for. Yes. Amen. Now please don't take anything back, even those watching on video or listening on CD, to think that I have anything against our military. Because I am not. I support them 100%. I appreciate all those who have volunteered to fight for me and my freedom. What I'm speaking out against today when I say stuff like that is against those who are in charge and are putting our boys in harm's way for no good reason. And that upsets me. But I'm telling you today, God, Yahweh God, the Father, our Commander-in-Chief has a plan. And there's a battle that's worth fighting for. The fight we enter into, though, what we must understand, has many distractions. <coughs> There's many distractions surrounding that battle, but if we would stay focused on the object or the subject of the battle, the object of the battle, which we're told the object of our faith is our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay focused, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, stay focused on the author and the finisher of our faith. Before the joy set before him, endure the cross, despising his shame. If you, as those would enlist in this army, not Shannon's army, but in Yahweh's army, if you would enlist, you would find the battle worth fighting for. And if you stay focused on the object of this battle, and you recognize it, you will not grow weary and you will not faint. But if you allow distractions to come in, you will grow weary and you will grow faint. So let's move on to the message today. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to read verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Father, Yahweh God, we praise you today. I pray your anointing upon this message that it would be simple straightforward, and that those hearing would grasp the truths in it. Thank you, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Paul's message. You can read 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 11. And actually, verses 1 through 10. About all the distractions, the things that takes place. And he's telling Timothy, he's encouraging him, he's exhorting him to get in this battle to fight the good fight of faith. And what he does here, he encourages Timothy to be a soldier to enter into battle. Now we know Timothy is, a go is going to be a pastor. We know Timothy is considered a son. Paul is mentoring him. And Timothy is considered a son in the faith to the Apostle Paul. What a mentor, by the way. What a mentor. You ever thought about being a mentor to somebody? Think about that for a minute. Paul encourages Timothy to be a soldier, to enter into battle. But what he is not to do is to war after the flesh. Okay? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. You see, a conventional battle, we understand, it's a battle where we take up arms against another nation and we fight that battle with warfare arms that we know that has been created for us to go out and take on the enemy. But this warfare is different. It's not fleshly, and we're not to go after it. It's the good fight, he says. You see, we wonder, what is a good fight? You see, we're supposed to be peaceful people. But Paul says in verse 12, fight the good fight. Yes. Can you think of any fight that is good? What kind of fight that you're talking about could have good results? Because there's no good results in a physical battle. Okay? Even though a nation... The results of one nation overcoming another nation being victorious, there's still a lot of bad things that happen. Yeah. Whether you want to admit it or not. But in this battle, it's a good fight with good results. Now, what Timothy is exhorted to do here is he must be willing to confront corruption. As a pastor of a church, he will have to confront corruption. He will also have to confront temptation because many pastors down, many, down through the years have given in to corruption and temptation. And he must also oppose spiritual force, forces in high places. That's a lot to do. A lot to think about right there. There's three fronts he has to battle right there. Corruption, temptation, 
and then these spiritual forces in high places. A whole other message about the high places. I won't get into it this morning. I'll try to stay focused, okay? What he is ultimately to realize, good point, sister. What he's ultimately to realize is his calling. And what he's called to here is this. Fight the good fight of faith, what Paul tells us to do. He's called to lay hold on eternal life to which you were called. His calling was to lay hold on to eternal life. We're encouraged in Revelation to take hold of eternal life that no man take it from us. You see, enter into this battle that we're encouraged to now I want to talk to you as your pastor the one who God has placed here, Yahweh God has placed here, He is telling me to exhort you to the much same things what Timothy is being exhorted to by the Apostle Paul. You're exhorted to confront corruption, temptation, and oppose spiritual forces in high places. But what we have to understand is this. When we enter into this battle, as we enter into this army, it is a struggle from the very beginning. Just a few minutes ago, I shared with you about that struggle that you would all have at times when it comes for the invitation or it comes where you know you need prayer, you know you need to take a moment to set aside for prayer, whether it be at church, whether it be at home, and there's a struggle there. And the struggle is that between the flesh and the spirit. Scripture teaches us the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. But what we have to understand is when we enter into this battle and enlist into this army first and foremost, before we even think to enter into battle, Yeshua said this, strive to enter into the straight gate. And we read other passages that says, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, burn it down the cares of the world and I'll give you rest. There's an open invitation there to come to Yeshua. There's an open invitation to come to Him. But then He goes on and He says in different passages that we understand and read where He says here, strive to enter into the straight gate. What's that mean? It's a struggle. Even entering in, even coming to Yeshua, even when we come to Him at the point where the Holy Spirit is dealing with us. You see, there's a general call to the whole world. And the general call is the message that John the Baptist preached and the message that Jesus preached. You know what it is? Do you know what John the Baptist preached? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Apostle Paul writes it in Romans chapter 10 that the kingdom is near you and it's even in the map. If you will confess right there, the kingdom is that close. It's that close to you right there. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom is at hand. That's what he meant. It's right there at your door. All of us hear the general call. Okay? But then there's a point in time where the Holy Spirit deals with you on a much deeper level. After you hear the call, you see the whole world hears the call, but those who come to Christ in faith hear a much deeper call. We read about in Romans chapter 8. A much deeper call to deal with you on a personal level. You see, it's a general call to the whole world. We all hear it. Everybody hears it. Eternity is set in the heart of every man. And that means we all wonder about heaven. I'll make it a little more in layman's terms. What about heaven and hell? What about this stuff called sin? Uh, where will I go when I die? Why am I here? Is evolution real or is creation real? Those kind of questions you deal with upon coming to this threshold at the straight gate. You hear about it, you wonder about it, but then the Holy Spirit begins dealing with you on a much more personal level. You say, well, how can I get more personal than that? He starts dealing with you in what Yeshua says about your sin, personal sin, concerning righteousness and judgment. That's what Yeshua said. The Holy Spirit, when He comes, will deal with the world about righteousness 
by sin, by judgment. And so he starts dealing with you on a much more personal level about your sin. About your life before God. And you start asking questions. How you can always tell someone is on the threshold of that straight gate is when they're asking questions about God, about heaven, about where they would go, things like that. And maybe that's you. I'm going to stop this for a minute. I'm keeping this message very plain. And not because you're plain, but because I do not want to diminish the power of the cross or the message of the gospel. Maybe that's you. Or maybe you know someone right now that's going through this. And I'm not trying to get you to say, phew, well, he's not talking about me no more. But if that's you, and you've been asking questions about heaven and hell, you've been asking questions and wondering where you might go and where about this and more on a personal, I'm going to tell you something right now that the Holy Spirit is already dealing with you. He's talking to you. And I'm talking to those no matter what your age is. Okay? Because... I know for a fact that even a young person, be it five years old, can come to Christ. They can ask questions. I've seen it. Maybe you are asking questions. Jesus said here, strive to enter in the straight gate. What we have to do, we have to go past what our natural mind thinks. You see, the book of Proverbs says there's a way that, I think it's in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, this is part of my notes that got deleted, by the way. In Proverbs 14 and 12, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end of that way leads to death. You might reason yourself totally away from all what you feel and hear. And I, matter of fact, I've even seen it to an extent to where someone that was being dealt with by the Holy Spirit, went to a lawyer and came back and sued the pastor and that church for the psychological problems they encountered while they were at that church. And it came down to simply this. This actually happened. It came out of this. They were convicted by the Holy Spirit. They didn't know how to handle those problems. And they thought it was some kind of social. You know how far lawyers can go with social things and psychological things? You don't want to get arrested or put in jail for actually what you do as much anymore as what you think anymore. Now, folks, that's what's going to happen. You're going to see that take place in this nation. We're going to get arrested for what we think. You see that?